You could argue, Andreas, that in the last 30 to 40 years, the UK, Germany and France were really the glue at times fighting that held Europe together. Germany's now in the throes of political crisis. We don't exactly know where the coalition is. France is trying to, to rebuild right, Europe with little success at the moment, and the UK you know, is going through Brexit. What will be left of Europe in five, ten years? I think, the, I think in five or ten years, if you ask me now, what would be my bet is Europe will be exactly where it is today, minus the UK, probably. Um, I think Europe will not break apart, neither will the Eurozone. I think the political will is, is strong. I think it's interesting that the support for the Euro and the European Union in most European Union countries is at a multi-year high. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's very strong. I think the, the, uh, the, the restructuring of Spain, Portugal, Ireland, I should say, the successful restructuring post 2010, 11, 12, um, is a is a proof that the euro can work. I think yeah. a lot of people had said that it can't work. You can't nominally um, deflate. Well, these countries have done it, and the debt to GDP ratios of these countries are are well within 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 touching distance of the Maastricht criteria. So mm -hmm. I think I, I don't detect an overwhelming sense of crisis in Europe, but there is a very significant need, and that's understood to redefine what Europe means both on the global stage as well as for its citizens. Okay, we talk about NATO having the tools or not to, to deal with what's coming next. Do central banks have the tools to deal with what's coming next? When you have President Trump saying actually he has no deadline for the China deal, it may come in, in 12 months from now, how do central banks react to that? Well, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that you should even ask the question because 10, 15 years ago, we wouldn't have thought that the central banks need to be the solution to the geopolitical problems because they had a clear mandate, control inflation, uh, keep control of the money supply. But you're, of course, you're absolutely right. Central banking is becoming more politicized again, and they, they definitely see themselves part of the solution. Just witness the comments on the ECB and what they might be thinking about purchasing in terms of the, green de the new European Green Deal. I mean, if it doesn't get much more political than that, we don't even know that there is a mandate for that. But, and this is, this is where it becomes different from the last five or ten years, it is also clear that the central banks alone cannot do the necessary job. And I think this is where Christine Lagarde um, comes in. We talked about this previously on the show. I think Christine Lagarde is going to try to co-opt the European political establishment to try to work on fiscal policy so that fiscal policy and monetary policy can work in tandem to resolve the structural growth problems of Europe. Andreas, where are you positioned on Europe in the equity markets? I mean, we're doing all this international relations today, this politics as well, but at some point I've got to put institutional money to work. Can you go long Europe? I think it's difficult to generalize. What is definitely the case is that European equity assets are relatively speaking cheap. Compound that with a relatively cheap euro, or let's put it differently, an expensive dollar. Um, I think that, make, that has all the making for relative outperformance. Now, it's very sector specific, obviously, and if we're going to go into even more trade tensions, given how export orientated the European stock market is, I think there'll be some, some sectors, notably the car sector, that will fa face some challenging times.